Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Lovell and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is the work that followed on from my MSci project, which I did at UCL with Alex Piggott, Tim Blackburn and Ellie Dyer. So I'm going to introduce you to environmental resistance as an alternative approach for predicting the spread of alien species. And this method is unique because it doesn't require any information on an invading species ecological niche. So alien species are species that have been introduced to an area outside of their native range. And this plot shows the number of newly recorded alien species. And as you can see, the number of aliens is increasing dramatically. These species can have negative impacts on biodiversity, human health and human livelihoods. So we need to be able to reliably predict how they will spread in order to mitigate these potential impacts. Most models for predicting alien spread will take the conditions occupied in the species' native range and project these into the invaded area in order to predict environmental suitability. But these kinds of species distribution models or ecological niche models rely on the assumption that a species' current native distribution reflects its climatic tolerances. But this is not necessarily the case, and so these kinds of models can be unreliable. An example of this is shown by Early and Sachs, who compared climatic conditions occupied by plants in their native and alien ranges. So this is for plant species that are native to Europe and had been introduced to the USA. On these maps, the black areas are the observed alien range for each species, and the colours indicate the climatically suitable areas based on their alien range in orange and based on their native range in blue, and yellow is the overlap between the two. So for the species on the left, areas predicted suitable based on its alien range mostly fall within the conditions considered suitable based on its native range, but there's still been a modest amount of niche expansion into this orange area here. For the second species on the right, there's lots of orange areas, indicating that it's undergone dramatic niche expansion in its alien range. And so a much larger geographical area is climatically suitable and was predicted based on its native range. So overall, they found that many species alien ranges occupied climatic conditions that were not occupied in their native range. And so using native conditions to predict alien distributions would be unreliable. This highlights the problem of using ecological niche models. So if we'd have used the native distribution of this species to predict its alien spread, we would have missed all of these areas in orange that have been found to be suitable based on the observed alien range. This limited transferability of ecological niche models is a problem for being able to predict alien spread, and it raises the question of whether the, there's a different approach that doesn't rely on niche estimates, and this led us to the idea of environmental resistance. So a well-known trend in biogeography is that as you get further away from a site, species communities will become less similar. So for example, this map shows the patterns of biotic similarity of bird communities relative to a focal site in Africa, which is indicated by the arrow. So the more yellow areas are sites that contain a higher number of the species that are present at this focal site. Eduardo Rappaport proposed that taking these gradients of biotic similarity could provide an index of environmental resistance. So if we take this scale and we flip it around, this gives us our environmental resistance measure. So environmental resistance of one site relative to another site would be 1 minus the biotic similarity between the two sites. So a site sharing more species with the focal site will have a lower environmental resistance and a site sharing less species with the focal site will have a higher environmental resistance. And when environmental resistance is mapped, it reveals patterns that reflect the environmental gradients and the geographic barriers that are limiting the spread of species in an area. The idea of using environmental resistance dates back to Eduardo Rappaport's book Areography, which was originally written in Spanish in 1975 and then later translated into English. And Rappaport suggested that we could take these patterns of environmental resistance and then use them to predict how a newly introduced species would spread through the landscape. So the idea is that if we know an alien has successfully established a population at a site, then the native species in that area could essentially tell us what is limiting ranges there. So if the conditions are stopping native species from spreading between areas, they may also be stopping aliens from spreading. Despite Rappaport's environmental resistance model being attractively simple, as far as we know, it hadn't been tested since. So we wanted to test whether the environmental resistance model could predict the spread of alien birds. 
So from the Gavia database, we have information on where alien bird populations, populations originally established. So we were able to map these known introduction locations to a grid cell and then start our simulations from cells that correspond to the known sites of alien population establishment. So once we had this cell where a population was known to have established, we could then look at the native bird species that were present within this cell, and then we could see what proportion of these focal cell species were also present in other cells. And then this could be used to find the environmental resistance to spread. You can see here in this simplistic illustration, this cell on the right contains all the species from the focal cell. So this cell has a biotic similarity of one and an environmental resistance of zero. The cell on the top here though, contains none of the focal cell species. And so this cell has a biotic similarity of zero and an environmental resistance of one. So Rappaport's idea is that if we know a species had successfully established at the focal site, under the environmental resistance model, it would be more likely to spread into cells with a lower environmental resistance to spread. So that's those cells with a higher biotic similarity to this establishment cell. So here, the cell on the right, which has a lower environmental resistance and a more similar community, will have a higher probability of being invaded. Then this cell on the top, with a high environmental resistance and a less sim similar community, will have a lower probability of being invaded. So we ran these simulations with probability determined by the environmental resistance relative to the establishment site, and then we stopped our simulations when the observed range size was reached. We ran this for all alien birds, but here is one example for the house finch, which has been introduced to the United States at two sites indicated by, by these black dots. The red line is the observed alien range for this species, and the heat map is the predicted distribution across 100 repeat simulations of the environmental resistance model. So you can see that the environmental resistance model predicted this species range quite well, with an accuracy of 83%. But what about other species? Well, across all alien bird species, on average, environmental resistance predicted spread with an accuracy of 77%. So it performed pretty well. But because we started our simulations from the known sites of alien establishment, you would expect some overlap simply due to chance. Therefore, we compared the environmental resistance model to a model of random dispersal, where all cells were invaded with equal probability. And under this model, spread from the introduction site was completely random. So this is our null model. So if we go back to our example species, house finch, under this random dispersal model, there was a relatively high overlap between simulated and observed ranges. For this species, overlap was lower than the environmental resistance model. It was only 65% for the null model, compared to 83% under environmental resistance. And again, this was similar across all species. So on the graph here, y is the predictive accuracy of the environmental resistance model, and x is the predictive accuracy of the random dispersal model. So each point represents a species, and the point size is proportional to the range size. So on average, across all species, the random dispersal model predicted ranges with an accuracy of 68%, and this was significantly worse than the environmental resistance model. So the environmental resistance model was better for 78% of species. So this is the points above the line here. But the random dispersal model, our null model, could be rejected for 22% of species, which are indicated in red. Although 22% may not sound like much, it's actually quite high considering that most aliens have a small range size, and so there's limited statistical power. So... Having shown that environmental resistance outperformed a model of random dispersal, we wanted to compare it to more traditionally used climate-based models. We ran several climate models, but because of time, I'm only going to highlight one in this talk. So this model is based on climate matching to the invading species' native range. So the alien species is more likely to spread into areas that are more similar in climate to the conditions it occupies within its native range. And for this particular model, we used the combination of climate axes that best predicted the species native range. So for this model, all information was derived from the native range, as it would be in practice when predicting the spread of a newly introduced alien species. Just to note, we didn't directly fit ecological niche models, but rather simply simple climate matching models. So going back to our example species, 
This climate matching models model didn't perform very well, and it only predicted the range with an accuracy of 59%. And again, this was similar across all species, with this model performing significantly worse than the environmental resistance model, and an average predictive accuracy of only 65%. So on the plot here, the x-axis is now the climate model. As you can see, for most species, environmental resistance was better. And this climate model was actually worse than a model of random dispersal. So this model, which used information from the native range, was pretty poor. But just to note, some of our other climate models did perform better than this particular one, but they required information that would not be known before an alien species had spread. And even then, the environmental resistance model was significantly better than all of the climate models that we ran. So even though climate clearly does shape alien ranges, in practice, climate matching can't predict spread because different factors are probably influencing alien and native ranges. So we've shown that environmental resistance, which is based on spatial patterns of community similarity, is a powerful predictor of the spread of alien species. It allows the prediction of species for which we know little about. This suggests that the environmental resistance model will be a useful tool for predicting the spread of alien species, and we hope that it will complement existing niche-based models. I just want to say a big thank you to my co-authors, Alex Piggott, Tim Blackburn and Ellie Dyer. And I also want to just acknowledge that Rappaport thought of this idea many years before we did. And also that this wouldn't have been possible without the bird range data that we obtained from BirdLife and from Gavia. And also the climate data which we obtained from WorldClimb. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>